Hi, my name is Elisaveta Shashkova, and today I would like to present my talk, The Hidden Power of the Python Runtime. I'm a software developer. I'm working at JetBrains on the PyCharm IDE. I've been working on Debugger for several years, and now I'm focused on scientific features in PyCharm. Currently, I'm located in the Russian city St. Petersburg and recording this talk right from my home. So, let's start. Python language is very simple and beautiful, but very big part of the language power is hidden from users and available only at runtime, only during execution. You might even don't know about it, but you already use this hidden power every day. For example, we run tests every day. Let's compare two popular ways to do it in Python. Standard module unit tests or very popular test framework PyTest. The easiest way to see the difference between them is to execute assert statements. In case of failure, unit test will report assertion exception and will show you a place where it happened, just like any other exception in Python. But PyTest will show you detailed information about values which you tried to compare. Where did PyTest get this information? Of course, from the runtime. And today, during this talk, we will learn how Python runtime works, how Python allows to inspect current program state, and how runtime information can be used in different development tools, including PyTest assertion errors reporting. Let's start with learning about fundamental concepts of Python runtime. There is a popular, popular phrase that everything is an object in Python. That means that every variable even isn't just a simple piece of memory, but a complicated entity with values and associated operations. This object-based nature is true not only for core types like numbers or strings or collections or something else, but it's also true for program unit objects like functions, classes, and even modules. All these types of objects are declared explicitly. Interpreter creates new object when you use assignment statement, or when you declare new function with def keyword, or when you declare new class with class keyword. But during the program execution, Python interpreter creates not only objects which you defined explicitly in your code. It also creates a lot of util objects representing execution process. And one of the key uh, objects among them is a stack frame. Stack frame object represents a program scope in Python. This object contains information about current execution state like a code object, local and global variables, and a lot of other data. Frames are stored in a stack-like structure. The bottommost frame, sometimes called a module frame, represents a, fra a module from which execution was started. In this example, execution process is on the line 7, and it's going to call function foo. When Python interpreter enters new scope during execution, it creates new frame object and then puts it onto the stack on top on other frames. When execution process leaves the scope, in our example returns from function foo, interpreter removes frame object from the top and passes some data to the previous frame. And execution in the previous frame continues and goes to the line 8, and, and that's it. <laughs> this is a very rough description, but the main idea looks like this. In fact, this runtime machinery and the concept of call stack are the same for many other programming languages. But the major difference between them and Python is that not so many languages contain this runtime information out of the box. In Python, frame objects can be accessed as a usual Python objects right in your program, and you can retrieve a lot of interesting information from it. In the next part, we will learn how we can do it, how we can inspect internal execution state. 
As we discussed in the previous part, the key concept of the execution process is a stack frame. In any place of your program, you can get the current stack frame by calling function getFrame from standard module sys. This function returns a frame object from the call stack for the current thread. It has an optional argument depth, which determines a depth in a stack. That is a number of calls below the top. So if you pass zero to this function, you will get the current frame object. Let's check which information is stored inside frame object. First of all, frame object contains a dictionary with local variables of the current scope. If you define some variable, you can access it by its name. It's just a usual dictionary, you can iterate over it, but you can't update it from Python code. It's possible to do only from C API. Also, frame object gives you access to global variables dictionary. When we are talking about global variables, we mean global variables for the current module. Now we know how to get information about defined variables. Cool! But to be honest, we don't need frame object to get this information, because there are built-in functions locals and globals, which return exactly the same dictionaries. The good news is that variables dictionaries isn't the only interesting information stored inside frame object. The second interesting thing is a code object, which is also stored as a frame attribute. Code object represents a chunk of executable code, but it differs from function object uh, because it doesn't contain reference to the global execution environment. The easiest way to create code object is to call a built-in function compile. Compiled code object can also be evaluated by passing it to built-in function eval. You can see here an example we evaluated value of our code object C. Code object contains a lot of information as well. It's a file name where this code object was created, a name of a function or module where it was defined, a list of variables names which were used inside this code. It also contains a bytecode object, a sequence of executable statements. With the help of function dis from the standard module dis, you can even disassemble it and read comments which were generated by the interpreter. Code object contains much more attributes, but these are the most important for us today. Let's return to a frame object. In addition to variables and code object, Frame also stores information about current line number which is being executed. It stores a tracing function which helps to trace events in the current frame and which we'll discuss later. And it also stores a link to the previous frame. As you remember, frames are stored in a stack-like data structure, and the easiest way to inspect state of the current frames is to iterate over them with a link to the previous frame. This is exactly how exception traceback works. When exception was raised in your program, and if it wasn't handled, Python prints these beautiful tracebacks into output, so you can understand how you reached this place in the program. Frame objects and links between them is a mechanism which helps to get this information and show it to you. And this is only the most important information stored in a frame object, but not all the information. Many useful functions are implemented in Inspect standard module. It has a whole separate group of functions for examining the interpreter stack. But one important thing which you should remember when you work with frame variable is that you shouldn't forget to delete this variable when you are leaving the scope. Otherwise, you can create a reference cycles and these objects will stay alive much longer. It can lead to delayed object destruction and even memory consumptions. Okay, in this part we've learned that when we write and execute our Python code, we might even don't think about how many interesting objects were implicitly generated by our source code. That's great, but how can we use it in our everyday lives? The next part will learn how different development tools use this information and help you to become more productive 
when you are working with Python code. As you remember in the beginning of this talk, we've learned that Bytest can show a search and error with exact values which were compared. Now we have enough knowledge to understand how it was implemented. Let's create our own tool, which will be showing values of variables which were used inside a search statement. Every exception object stores a traceback object in dunder traceback attribute. And traceback contains the most important for us object, frame object. And we already know, if we have access to frame object, we know everything about program state. And our function will look like this. It takes exception object as an argument. From exception object we can get traceback and frame. From frame we can get code object, and from code object we can get everything. For example, a source code. We know line num where exception happened. We have a source code. So, with the help of standard module AST, we can get variables names used exactly on this line. I don't show you this function here. You can find its source uh, code in my repository with examples. I'll share the link in the end of my talk. But we get names of uh, these variables, we can. F uh, that means that we can find variables values for these names because we have a dictionary with local variables inside our frame object, and this is how it works. We can use our function the following way. And during exception handling, uh, we should pass exception object to our new function, and it will print variables values to the output even without bytest. It can be very helpful, for example, for logging. If stack trace isn't enough, you can automatically log all the variables values used inside failed assertion statement and get all, the, all this information. And, of course, it can be extended to any other exception type. So, as you can see, with the knowledge about Python runtime, you can create some really cool tools. <laughs> of course, our function is much less powerful than functions implemented in PyTest, but the main idea is very, very similar. The second tool which heavily relies on runtime is Debugger. As I've already said in the beginning of my talk, I've been working on PyCharm Debugger for several years. And the reason why I know so much information hidden inside frame object is that debuggers are one of the main tools which use this information. Nowadays, debuggers are based on one of two main functions, tracing function and frame evaluation function. When tracing function was set for the frame, it will be called for every event which happens in the program. It takes three arguments, frame, event, and arg. If tracing function was specified, frame object stores a link to it in ftrace attribute. Debugger based on tracing function analyzes events in the program uh, which arrive to tracing function and suspends the program in a place where user put their breakpoint. Frame evaluation function has the following signature. Uh, frame evaluation function is being executed before uh, the frame started to execute. Debugger based on frame evaluation function inserts breakpoints code right into frame's code object. We are not going to discuss its, its internals now. If you want to learn more about it, feel free to watch my talk from PyCon US 2017, Debugging with Python 3.6. But what we are interested in now is that both of these functions take frame object as an argument. And all the things we've learned in the previous part help debugger to show information to user. Frame object helps debugger to understand whether execution reached a breakpoint and highlight corresponding line in the editor. Variables pane, where you see values of the local variables, is based on frame f locals dictionary 
A list of frames, which you see during your debug session, is also received from frame object by iterating over frame fback attributes. As you can see, information stored inside frames help debugger to work and show you information about current program state. But there are also some other tools. Another tool is a code coverage. Code coverage helps you to understand which lines in your code base were executed uh, during run and check, for example, were they covered with tests or not. It's a very important tool because it gives you a confidence that your code base is well developed and maintained. The most popular, popular library for code coverage is coverage.py. It has extremely cute mascot, Sleepy Python. Coverage.py is based on the same tracing function, which we've already seen in Debugger. And as you already know, tracing function takes three arguments, one of which is a frame object. And again, thanks to frame object, coverage tool can collect information about file name and line number, which were executed, store it, and then show you inside your coverage report. Oh well. We discussed debuggers, pytest, code coverage, but there is another group of tools based on runtime information. They are runtime typing tools. Tools which collect type information during program execution and then help you to generate type annotations right inside your source code. I found information about three tools doing this, but there might be more of them. PyAnnotate by Dropbox collects types of function arguments and then inserts type annotations right into your code. MonkeyType by Instagram does something similar. It collects information about types of your arguments and then generates stub files for your project uh, based on this collected information. The option Collect Runtime Information, available in PyCharm ID, does also something similar. If this option is enabled, debugger starts to collect type information about every function. And later, if you would like to generate doc string for some function, PyCharm will use collected information during doc string generation. All these three tools use runtime information. Let's learn how they are implemented. By annotate and monkey type are both based on a sys.setProfile, which works with profile function, which is very similar to tracing function. It takes exactly the same three arguments, but it isn't called on every line of your code. It's called only when you call some function or method. And it's logical because for tracing function arguments, uh, you need to trace only call events, not every event in your program. As I've already said, collect runtime information in PyCharm is integrated with debugger, so it also has access to a frame object. So, how can we get types of arguments if we have access to frame object? First of all, we can get a list of argument names defined in the current frame, because everything is stored inside a code object. We've already seen this code object's attributes today in the beginning of my talk. And as you remember, we have a dictionary, dictionary with local variables, so we have access to objects and therefore to their types. So, for each function we already know variables names, their types, and location where this function was defined. We can store this information and use it later for type annotations generation. And this is how all these tools are implemented with the help of frame object and corresponding code object. We discussed several tools which are based on runtime information in Python, but all of them are quite complicated. Let's try to create something small but useful. Our own tool, which is also based on runtime information and which will help us to detect problems, for example, in concurrent execution. 
There are two ways to execute tasks uh, concurrently inside one Python process – threads and asynchronous tasks. With the help of standard module threading, you can start a new thread, which will execute your function concurrently. For synchronization between threads in Python, there are uh, synchronization objects. And the most fundamental synchronization object is a lock object. Thread can acquire lock object, and that means that the following block of code will be executed by this and only by this thread until it will release this lock object. Uh, Python lock objects are also context managers, so you can work with them with keyword with. <laughs> Running more than one thread and using lock objects sometimes can lead to a deadlock. A deadlock is a stake when state when several threads are waiting for resources which can't be released. The easiest way to reproduce this situation is the following. Create two threads, two lock objects, and acquire these lock objects in different orders. First thread acquires lock number one, second thread acquires lock number two. The first thread wants to acquire lock number two, but it's unavailable, so it starts to wait it. Second thread wants to acquire lock number one, but it's also unavailable. As you can see, this situation can't be resolved without program interruption because threads will be waiting for their lock objects forever. And this is very sad. And if you have a really large code base, it might be difficult to detect deadlock in your code. And even static code analysis can't help you here, because deadlock happens at runtime, during code execution. But we already know a lot of cool things about Python runtime and we can try to apply them here. We've already used sys.getFrame function, which returns frame object for the current thread, thread. But there is also another useful function, sys.currentFrames, which returns topmost stack frame for every thread in the current Python process. And the coolest thing about this function is that it works even with deadlocked threads. With the help of this function, we can create our own tool, which will uh, be printing tracebox for threads with some interval, and will help us to find place where threads are stuck in deadlock. That's it. Simple and powerful tool is ready. But there is one problem. This functionality is already implemented in standard library inside fault handler module. It has a function which prints tracebacks of all the running threads to a file, and it's implemented natively and in C code. But not all the things were implemented before us. As you remember, there is a second way to execute some code concurrently – asynchronous tasks. And there are very similar synchronization objects in asyncio module, and therefore a synchronous deadlock can appear in your code. That means that there is a place where we can apply our fresh knowledge about Python runtime and create a synchronous version of fault handler. Several useful functions are already implemented inside asyncio module. The first one is asyncio.alltasks, which returns all the running tasks in a loop, and the second one is tasks method get stack, which returns list of frames for this task. Our async fault handler will work like this. In a separate thread, we are running in a loop, in an infinite loop. And with a given time, timeout, we dump tasks tracebacks. Now, if we suspect uh, that we have a synchronous deadlock somewhere in our code, we can quickly check it with our asynchronous fault handler and find a place where this deadlock appeared. Great! We've implemented a simple but powerful tool for detecting deadlocks with asynchronous tasks. And uh, that was the last tool we were going to consider today. In this part, we've learned several tools which are based on program's runtime information. 
I would like to emphasize it one more time that these tools collect information which is impossible to get just from the source code. You can make some assumptions based on source code, but only at runtime you can get the real values of variables and the real program state. And this is extremely cool feature of the runtime-based development tools. Today we've learned a lot about Python runtime. As we've seen during the talk, runtime information can be used in any part of the development process – during testing, during debugging, even during concurrent code execution. I hope after this talk you'll start using runtime development tools more often because they really help to write more reliable code and, for example, find bugs in it much faster. And maybe you'll even create your own new tool. After this talk, you have enough information to do it. That would be really great if you did. If you decide to do experiments, here are some links, a repository with today's examples, source code, of course, feel free to read Python official documentation about any standard module we use today. And also, I'll be happy to answer your questions in the comments of this video, or by email, or in my Twitter account. Thank you very much for watching me today, and bye-bye!